What does it mean to have great faith? It means confronting adversity with the Word of God. It means declaring God's promises even when facing great obstacles. It means seeing the promises of God. Great faith is placing your entire confidence in what God has said. Let this be a year of great faith. Great faith. This is the series we're getting into for the next six weeks, right? And these are men and women in Scripture that are flawed and yet God granted faith so that they can persevere in the severest and toughest time. I love what Pastor John Aron said this week in one of our uh, fasting services. He said, you know what? God, you can't have great faith because in and of yourself, you can't. How many of you understand that? That it's in and of ourselves, we can't. It is God who gives us the faith. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He starts it and he will complete it. And so what does it mean to have great faith? Why do we need great faith? Why? Because the current realities that we have to be able to reach God's promises, we need faith. You and I need faith because the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We're told in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. It's impossible to please God. So we need faith to please our King. Now, what is faith? I'll explain what faith is by explaining what faith is not. Okay? It's not you know, when you look at a person or when you say, you know, this guy has faith or this guy has great faith, sometimes we think, well, because he has his an, uh, prayer items always answered because great ang faith niya. He always has great faith. That's why every prayer that he prays gets answered, which can be dangerous sometimes because we end up saying or having faith in our faith. That I will be, my, my prayers will be answered because I have great faith. How many of you know that's dangerous? Our faith is in God, not in our faith. And so what is it? It's not faith in our faith. It's not having Christian jargon or lingo. How many of you know sometimes we start speaking Christianese? Oh, brother, sister, we stumble in hallelujah, right? And so it becomes just a Christian jargon, right? And so... Um, we become religious. And guys, listen. When you become a Christ follower, please don't get weird. Am I when you pray, Lord, 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 Jesus and Lord becomes a filler to your prayer. Okay, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, God, Savior Jesus, Amen. And so just, just don't get weird. Just, just talk to Jesus, all right? Um, I remember this uh, kid who had an, a math exam, okay? Jesus is always the answer, all right? The teacher said, not this time, okay, not this question, minus five, right? And so, actually, another one, uh, I forgot to study. My teacher is going to hell if she fails me, okay? Jesus is always the answer. Jesus, 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 okay? It's not saying Jesus all the time in every statement or coding of verse. Is that great faith? What is great faith? It's not how we pray. It doesn't, you know, some people pray King James Version, right? You know, uh, thou art the sovereign king who heareth, houreth, prayereth. Okay, everything is old King James now, uh, old version. Or even the volume of our prayers. When we scream and shout, does that mean we have great faith? Is it in the volume of our prayers? You know, I remember this story. This is years ago. Somebody was casting out a devil, the demon out of a person. And, you know, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. In the name of Jesus, 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 I cast you out. And then she realizes it was the wrong statement. No, Jesus, Jesus, I cast you out. No, no, Jesus, come back, come back, okay? And so she was screaming and shouting and screaming the wrong thing. Is it, is a person that has, per, you know, is perfection of life, is perfection having great faith? Right? Listen, let me tell you something, okay? We're never going to be perfect on this side. Uh, uh, you know, the goal is not perfection. The goal is progress. God's sanctifying us. It's a sanctification process. 
We're moving from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from grace to grace. And so that's, you know, it's, it's not perfection of life. Or when you, see, when you see a person, he's always happy. Oh, because he has great faith. He has, it seems like he has no problems or no trials or no suffering. Does that mean the person has great faith? Well, the Bible says this is what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And the convictions of things that you don't see yet, even if you don't see it yet, you are convinced it's going to happen. You're convinced that God loves you. You're convinced that God will fulfill His promises in your life. The assurance of things hoped for. The word that was used here was literally to stand on something. To stand on God's word, to stand on His character, to stand on His will, to stand on His word. Let me borrow a, a chair, okay? To literally, okay, stand, okay? I think, okay, I, I hope, okay? This can carry me. I, I know it will carry me. I've sat on this chair. This is a 15-year-old chair. Your chairs are 15 years old, okay? And I know it's strong. It's been there for a long time. It's standing on something and believing that God will fulfill His promises and that His word will be able to hold you. That's what it means to have the assurance of things hoped for. It's not a wishful thinking. It's a conviction. God will and God can. The Niagara Falls would pump in about a 681,000 um, gallons per second Okay, into that falls, in that waterfall. 681,000 gallons per second. Right? And so, but, you know, there are turbulent rapids, as you could see, and, you know, when you visit the Niagara Falls. But, you know, about a mile or two previous to that, you could actually ride a boat and, you know, have a good time. But there's a huge sign that says, do you have an anchor? And do you know how to use it? <laughs> And so while you're using your boat, you have to be anchored or else you'll be swept into the Niagara Falls and fall into your death. Question for you, do you have an anchor? Do you know how to use it? When rough waters come, when typhoons and hurricanes happen, do you have an anchor? And do you know how to use it? And that's what we're going to talk about today in Hebrews chapter 10 as we study God's word, Hebrews chapter 10. And let me, let me give us a background of Hebrews. I briefly talked about this last week. We're quite unsure who wrote the book, the letter, the epistle, because um, for some reason, the person who wrote it did not reveal himself. Some say it's Paul, but it seems like literary style and genre are different. Okay, it's quite different from, uh, from the writings of Paul. Some say it's Apollos. Some say it's Barnabas. Some say it's Clement of Rome. Many different um, people have surmised who this person might be. However, right, what, it, what, what we're sure about is that it's filled with admonition and encouragement from Scripture because the people he was writing to, the Christians, were falling away from their faith because of severe persecution and trial. This was written about 65 AD, the year before 65 AD was, yeah, 64, of course, okay, but it was the great fire of Rome that Nero started and, 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 and blamed all the Christians for that fire. As a result, severe persecution continued. In fact, because of this persecution, what they would do is they would get the Christians, and when they would have gladiator um, events in the stadiums and arenas, halftime show was feeding Christians to the lions. I'm not making this up. This, you read history books, not even Christian history books. Regular, you know, just world history books, you will read this talking about what happened in those days. And they would light up the Christians. They would nail them or they would tie them on stakes and on poles. And they would light them up and burn them as light and lamps on the Apian way. Those were the things that they were going through at that time. And so with that as a backdrop, they were being told, 
Don't lose your confidence. Stay the course. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let go of your faith. And so there were things that he was saying, the author was saying, to look back and check out God's, remember God's faithfulness. To look forward to the, 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 the reward and all that God has planned for you. And then to look within. What does God call you to be? Who He has called you to be? And so let's look at that for a second. He talked about look back. Verse 32, the Bible says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. There, he talks about the sufferings, the persecution, the intense uh, difficulty that they were going through. He says, but recall the former days. Remember. Remember the time when you met Christ. Remember the time when you met Jesus. Remember when you were enlightened. Remember the former days when you're walking with God. You know, and, and how many of you, I hope you remember the time when you met Christ. I hope it's still fresh to you the way it was fresh for Kuyakim. And, and so, uh, if you don't remember the time when you met Christ, maybe you have not met Him and surrendered your life to Him yet. You've heard about Him. You've read about Him. You've been coming to church for years or maybe weeks, but you've never surrendered your life to Him as Lord and Savior of your life. And so, He says, recall, remember. Because the time previous to meeting Christ, how many of you know we were... We were blinded. We were blind. Our spiritual eyes were not open. We were, you know, we were even leading other people, blind leading the blind, right? Unless you have a bird box, right? And so you're just blind leading the blind, and you had no clue, and you were purposeless. You were aimlessly living your life. But he says, recall, remember. Remember the former days. The, the, world, the word that was used here literally said to reconstruct in your mind. To reconstruct that event. To reconstruct that moment. Do you remember that time when you gave your life to Christ? That specific hour, that specific event, that specific person talking to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that? He says, remember reconstructing your mind the former days when you were enlightened. What does this mean? This means because of what Jesus did, I will do what he calls me to do even if it's the most difficult thing in the world. He was saying, guys, don't let go. Don't let up. You know, stay the course, right? You know, my, I, I, you, know you know, my testimony, I, my parents uh, split up before I turned one and, and there was a lot of just insecurity in my heart, you know, and, and I was aimlessly living through life. In fact, I was such a man pleaser. I wanted to please everybody around me. And so, um, but God gave me a purpose. I stand here bef before you today and I'm grateful that God's given me a purpose. Um, and I was not, you know, I was not a person who, you know, got into drugs or drink, smoke, and chew and went with girls who do, you know. And so just, it wasn't that kind of a person. But, but, you know, I knew I was sinful. I don't know if you've ever felt this. You, 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 you like... I, I, I was religious on the outside, but I was unrighteous on the inside. And so I knew I needed a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so looking back means remembering His faithfulness. And that time when I gave my life to Christ and when somebody presented the gospel, I knew it was the right thing to do. Some of you, you're going to surrender your life to Jesus today. You've heard of Jesus as your best friend. But today you're going to give your life to him as Lord and he will be your master. I remember uh, one of our mission, one of our pastors in China and his name is Jackie. That's really not his real name. And when somebody shared the gospel to him and asked his name, you know, he told them the, his Chinese name, but nobody could, you know, pronounce his name. So he thought of another name. And so he thought, okay, Jackie, Jackie Chan. Okay. So he named himself Jackie. Okay. And so, um, and, and he he, when he was here, because he studied to become our, one of our pastors in China, he, his faith grew, and, and, and he became one of our pastors in China. And so he studied here in the School of World Mission. And so he, he, he had a notebook of all the provision and the faithfulness and the blessing of God 
while he, the, all the 10 months that he, while he was in school. So he would write it down. Number one, you know, when somebody would bless him or somebody would give, would somebody would give him andok manok, andok's manok, okay? He would write it down. Thank you, God, for chicken, all right? And so he was just so happy he got chicken. And so whenever he would not have any food in his refrigerator, Lord, you gave me andok, okay? Andok's manok, okay? You can give me baliwag or liempo or something, okay? And so remembering the faithfulness of God will allow us to press on. And so he said, guys, recall the former days. God has been faithful. He has not left your side. He has kept you in his grace all these years. Don't forget. Just look back. And then, you see the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, what then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he says, but he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all i don't know if you can give up your son or your daughter for somebody i mean i love lowell but i don't know if i can do it for lowell okay if you're a parent here today could you jesus okay god's uh, uh, god's did not spare his own son gave him up for all of us how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God gave us his son, you think he has and not willing to be able to give you everything else? Of course not. That's what the, uh, Paul says in Romans. And so you look, you look back at his faithfulness and then you look forward. The second thing he says, you look forward you, to what? He says in uh, verse 34, for you had compassion and those in prison, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. They were being disadvantaged. And sometimes, how many of you know life is unfair? And, and you are disadvantaged or you are, un, uh, you are abused. You're, you're being abused by somebody. And since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. He says, this life isn't all that there is. In fact, he's saying, listen, eternity is a game changer. When you understand the concept of eternity and what God has for us, it's a game changer. Because you realize what we have today compared to eternity pales in comparison. It pales in comparison. See, the perspective about, that we have about our future greatly affects how we will live today. How we see tomorrow greatly dictates on how we will live today. That's just how life is. You know, um, there's a guy, Viktor Frankl. Okay? He, he was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist. He wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. Phenomenal book. But he was incarcerated in the Nazi camps in the 40s. And he was with a lot of the prisoners. And when they found out he was a... You know, a psychiatrist, they started pouring out their hearts to him. And just the, the difficulty, the, the hopelessness, the anxiety. And, and this is what he had to say in his book. He said, a lot of them died not because of lack of food or lack of water, but because of lack of hope. That's what, they, what, they, that's what he said. In fact, he was talking about a guy who, an inmate who had a dream. First week of the month, and, and in his dream, sensed like a, he felt like it was a premonition. By March 30, the war is going to be over and we'll be out of here. And so March 3, 4, 5, 6, by March 29, he fell ill because he lost all hope that they, he was going to get out of it. March 31, he was gone. He died. Because you take away hope, you have no reason for living. You take away hope, you have no reason for waking up in the morning. And so that's what he said. In fact, look at what he said. Here's what he said. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Whatever comes my way, because I know the why and I know who I'm serving, it doesn't matter what comes my way because I know God is with me. I will face any how. Verse 35. He says, knowing all this, 
Therefore, do not throw away, throw away your confidence. Don't throw, and you know what? Some of you, this is the word of the Lord for you. This is the word of the Lord for you. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your assurance. Don't throw away your confidence, your assurance. You stand on God's word. You see, uh, when you do, you have a different perspective. Uh, you, ha you stand on the word of God. I am confident and I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I am confident that greater is he that's in me than he was in the world. I am confident that he knows the plans that he has for me. Plans to give me a hope and a future. I am confident that God's ways are higher than my ways. That his thoughts are way higher than my thoughts. I am confident that he can do uh, measurably more than I, uh, we can ask or imagine. That's the confidence that we have. And then he says after that, for you have need, in need of insurance, uh, endurance so that you, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. We look forward to what, the hope that we have in Christ. What is that? Yes, eternal life. But you see, once God establishes his kingdom and ushers in the new creation, everything will be made right every disadvantaged person will be given freedom every uh, every person that is suffering even through anxiety will bring will be healed how many of you know lazarus rose from the dead right but he had to die again okay but he now is living forever in the new creation in the kingdom of god you see, we pray and we ask the Lord for healing and the Lord does heal, but sometimes, okay, He does not. And I have no clue and I have no answer to that. But we will put our faith in Him no matter what. We look forward to the hope that we have in Christ. Bible says, Revelation 21, 22, that area right there, it says, time will come, God will wipe away, away every, every tear. No more pain. No more mourning. No more crying, no more death. The old order of things have come. That's the hope that you and I have. That's what we have. And then finally, I'll wrap it up with this one. Look within. We look back, we look forward, we look within. He says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Question, okay? How many of you here, you're righteous? Raise your hand. It's hard to raise our hands, right? Okay, okay. When you say, how many of you are right? Well, listen, if you base righteousness in your own merit, it's difficult to raise your hand. But if it's in the merit of Christ, then you can raise your hand. Why? Because, you know, when Jesus was, I'm going to ask the, the guys to bring up the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, he shouted, it is finished. The Greek word is tetelestai. And so when, he, when he, we, he said those words, it is finished, it's actually a marketplace terminology that, said paid, that means paid in full. Okay? And so people are probably wondering, what's happening here? There, is there a trade, a barter, an exchange? Is, is there a transaction? Because he said paid in full. So when he was on the cross, he, had, he was hanging there. He says, tetelestai, paid in full. There was an exchange that was going on. All right? Uh, scholars call it imputation, meaning his righteousness upon us and our unrighteousness upon him. That was, was what was going on. I'm going to ask uh, Lowell, Lowell can, you, can you help me out here? Okay, so Lowell will represent every single one of us. Okay, he's a sinner. Okay, a wicked, yeah. rotten <laughs> sinner. Okay, just like all of us, right? And so Lowell, okay, but, but when you think about when you think about what God did, you know, you, you think of He took our greed, all right, placed it on the cross. He took our bitterness and placed it on the cross. Our pride placed it on the cross. Okay? Our selfishness placed it on the cross. Our unforgiveness. Place it on the cross, slander. And there's a lot more that you can think of. Lust, uh, immorality, 
And, and a lot of the other things, they're external, they're easy, easier to detect. But some of these we've written down, they're more, uh, they're more dangerous because you don't see them. And so all that, Jesus, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of Christ. And so all that was placed on the cross. Jesus took it. Jesus embraced it. And the Bible says that the full wrath of God was poured out on Christ. Instead to us, of, of being poured out to us, it was poured out on Christ. Which is why he felt the, the separation there. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? For a brief moment when the sin of the world was on Christ, there was a separation from God. And so now, our sin on Christ, but listen, to us was given. We were given grace. We were given joy. We were given mercy. Okay, we were given love. Okay, these different things, provision, righteousness, healing, peace. How many of you, that's a lot, okay? Forgiveness and abundant life. All these God has placed on us in exchange. This is the great exchange. How many of you know that's an unfair exchange? But it's a great exchange indeed. Praise God for that, amen. And so this, in exchange for this, praise God. Thank you, Lowell. Can you give Lowell a big hand? The Bible says, but we are not of those who shrink back. Because of God's faithfulness, His salvation, His love, we will not shrink back. And because of what he has in store, the hope that he has for every single one of us, we will not shrink back. You could almost sense the emotion here. I don't know if you could sense the emotion. We're not going to shrink back. It seems like it's like if you could put emojis, if you could put background music, if you could almost picture William Wallace in front of his Scottish troops, but we are not of those who shrink back, right? It's like you could sense the, the emotion here. We're not destroyed, but we are people who preserve our souls. We're going to press on. We're not going to give up. To look within is understanding who, look, look within is understanding who God called us to be. This is who we are. We were, and now we are. New creation in Christ. That's who you are. You've been bought with a price. You've been purchased. You've been redeemed. The old self, remember, I remember um, Augustine. Um, he was walking down the old streets where he was. Because the bio, not the bio, but the, the history, uh, when you read the books, and even his biography, he talks about his old life. His mom prayed for him for years. And then he gave his life to Christ. And then one time he went back to his old town and he's, he was walking down the street. And this lady who he had sexual relationship with before called out to him, Augustine. Okay. And uh, Augustine, and he just kept moving forward. Hey, Augustine, okay, don't you remember me? All right. Uh, you know, I, I'm this person. I'm... Yeah, and, and he says, uh, he says, yeah, yeah, I sort of, I remember you, I remember you, okay? Um, and, and she said, uh, 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 why can't, why, why don't you want to, you know, hang out with me anymore? She says, because I'm not the same guy anymore. I'm not the same person anymore. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who are you? Who has God called you to be? And again, I said, we're not perfect, but we're being changed from glory to glory. Sanctification process. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? What This earthly tent right here is God's temple. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body that's the call for us that we're growing we're knowing him we're continuously moving forward 
we're called to glorify God in our body. And I, I appreciate Kim's testimony. He knew Jesus as his best friend. But when he surrendered his life to Christ as Lord and Savior of his life, everything changed. That no longer is he living his body or his life for his own. It's not for him. In fact, he's, he's one of the finest evangelists I know. He just, whenever he talks to people, he sparks up a conversation. From triathlon, he actually talks about Jesus after that. He says every, every race, he gets invited to start off uh, the race with a prayer. And he says, okay, I'll, I'll join, I'll join. Okay? He, he just opens up with a word of prayer and starts talking about God's word. And then when he's running, he says, I talk to people. Okay, and I pray with you. Can I can I pray for you? And of course, they would say yes. Please pray for me. Please pray for me because you know they're they're wanting to finish the race, right? And so, while they're running, he's gonna pray, and he's gonna talk about Jesus. His life now is determined by what Christ says, the Word of God. And so, you know, I'm grateful for for his life. And so today, as we end, I want to pray for a couple people today. Number one, if you don't remember or recall or you can't seem to reconstruct in your mind the time when you met Christ, maybe today is going to be the day when you will fully surrender your life to Christ. Let's bow our heads and, and let's pray. <clears throat> I want to pray for us here today. If you're here today, as, as our heads are bowed and you're saying, you know what, Paolo, that's, that's me. I, I've heard of Jesus. I have read about Jesus. But I've never fully surrendered my life to Christ. See, Jesus, if you can picture him today, is extending his hand. And he's saying, I'm calling you home. And he's saying, I have forgiveness in store for you. And as you come, I will be, yes, your Lord, but I'm also your Savior, the one who has the ability to give you a clean slate. If you're here today, if you want to surrender your life to Christ, maybe it's your first time today. Maybe you've come here for several weeks. Maybe it's been years. But today is the day where you will surrender your life to Christ. Let's lift up your hand if that's you. Maybe you're watching online. Just lift up your hand. All across this room. God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. There are several of you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you back there. Anybody else? Praise God. There are several of you. God bless you. And where you're at, I want you to pray this prayer and mean it from your heart. Because if it's just going to be mouthing the words, it won't mean anything. But just mean it from your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus. I know that I have sinned, but today, I surrender my life to you. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Not just best friend, not just somebody I can quote. but to have a real relationship with you, Jesus. I give you my life. You gave yours for me. It's about time I give mine to you. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that I have hope in Christ for the things to come in Jesus name Lord I pray for those that made that commitment today I ask Lord that you would seal their commitment and that they would continue to grow in their faith thank you God in the name of Jesus let's all stand those of you who lifted up your hands please approach us Lowell myself some of our leaders here in the front will be here for a few minutes and if you need to so we want to help you in your walk with Jesus second thing I want to pray for is this the Hebrew writer talked about endurance 
in a crowd like this, I'm almost sure there are those who feel that their faith has weakened or that their strength is failing. And I want to pray that God will continue to infuse faith, that God will continue to strengthen you and give you as you keep that hope up in front that there is a prize. Jesus is our prize and there's eternity. That one day we're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. The prayer is that, Lord, we will continue to run and not be faint. And we will soar on wings like eagles. Our strength renewed like the youth. Amen. Bow your heads. If you're here and you're saying, you know, I need an infusion of faith and just strength. Just lift up your hand if that's you. And I need that every so often too. And I, go, I have friends that I ask for prayer for. So I just want to pray. Lord, I pray for men and women who are lifting up their hands today. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would supernaturally infuse strength even now. Lord, that they would know that they have you. You are walking right beside them and that you're holding their hand. I pray, Father God, also for insight to their situation. I pray for grace in the severe testing. Lord, I pray for hope to continuously, Lord, be fueled every single day as we wake up each morning. I pray, Lord, for your, right, uh, for, for your, for your grace to overwhelm us today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. And let me, let me close this in prayer and let me bless you today. Let me read these verses. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth the length, the height, the depth, and the know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, I pray, these and more, let your righteousness, peace, and joy go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.